This is the best, the best. Do you hear me? Of the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Well, let's get to some headlines since we said goodnight last night. And what about it? They won the national championship. I mean, the real one, ad that is. So why not Alabama receive 150 stone national championship rings? This is what it looked like as uh, they came in. Certainly, uh, the maker of those rings doing well off of Alabama. That is the fifth time in nine years uh, they've made rings for the Crimson Tide. Yeah, it's uh, never happened before in the poll. Meanwhile, the losers, uh, excuse me, the UCF uh, unveiled the national championship rings. Uh, what did they do? They beat Auburn in the Chick-fil-A Bowl. Bo Scarborough, uh, not Bo Scarborough. Yeah, that is Bo Scarborough. <laughs> Bo, what about it? Bo's got some rings. No fake rings. No UCF rings. The real rings. <laughs> you know, it's, I, I, I'm done talking about anything other than the national champs because uh, I think too much of that has gone on. I started it many months ago with UCF. I'll let others finish it, but uh, we all know where the real national champion resides, and that is in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. They were at the White House two weeks ago. I didn't see anyone else being honored by the president for winning the college football national championship. Let's talk about today Lars Anderson from The Athletic. Talk about spring football, what crowds mean. Cole Kublik. New show on WJOX in Birmingham, Three Man Front, precedes us on our uh, one of our flagship stations for a very long time, and Wes Rucker on Jeremy Pruitt. How did his conversation about the fans go over in Big Orange Country? Read some, read a lot, read a lot of commentary up there. Uh, one by by Marvin West, a long time. Uh, Sports columnist used to be at the uh, New Sentinel said that Jeremy Pruitt should have been thanking fans if there were if there was any mistake made, it was by him doing away with fan, a fan day beforehand, signing autographs and bringing a lot of young people into the program. That did not happen this year. One reason why maybe the crowd was not up to Jeremy Pruitt's uh, wishes. Anyway, welcome to uh, Tuesday. Appreciate Peter Burns from for being in here yesterday. Uh, I, Peter's been here uh, twice in, in the last couple of days, and I've been the only, I've been the same state both times. Last Thursday, as I told you, Friday uh, we were uh, Mark Kubiak and I were in Athens doing some uh, stories, and last night I was in Atlanta hosting a banquet, the uh, American Football Coaches Association banquet. I'll talk a bit, little bit more about that later on, but saw a lot of. Uh, Great legendary coaches uh, at, at the Georgia Aquarium last night, so that's why Peter was here yesterday. So let's get to phone calls here at 855-242-7285, 855-242-7285. I know the big conversation everywhere yeah, yesterday in, involved Jalen Hurts, so a wide variety of conversation on exactly what is, <coughs> is going to happen. I know uh, Booger was here last night uh, saying he thinks Jalen Hurts will be the starter. I was uh, with, uh, talking to, to Andy Staples uh, yesterday as well from Sports Illustrated. He doesn't think he'll be there at all. So uh, that's how far two of the re- most respected voices in college football on completely different sides of the coin on Jalen Hurts' future. A lot of other stories going on. I heard a lot about uh, the dogs last night in Georgia, especially the new quarterback fields. We'll talk about that as well. Your phone calls, as I mentioned, 855-242-7285. That is where we are, and let's start with Thomas. Good afternoon, Thomas. Yeah, Paul, uh, I'm a big uh, Tide fan, and uh, I just want everybody to uh, understand that Alabama has never based our season on one player, so the Jalen Hurts uh controversy, I mean, it's up in the air with me because Coach Nick Saban is well, not well, hey, hey, hold on to, hold on a second, Thomas. I mean I, one thing we try to do here is keep it real. Let's not let's not blame a bunch of people. Do you realize why this story became a big deal? Do you have any idea? No. I'll explain it to you. 
His father made it a big deal. Jalen Hurts' father, in the interview with uh, Matt Hayes, we had Matt on Friday night, said if my son doesn't uh, win the starting job, he will become the biggest free agent in college football history. It was already a big story because of Tua coming in and saving Alabama's season in the national championship game. But but uh, Coach Hurts is the one who turned this into a uh, DEFCON 1 controversy. So I, I, I asked the, the callers tonight, say whatever you want. But let's not start blaming this person or that person because ultimately Mr. Hertz turned this into a big deal, a very, very big deal. I've never heard a father talk that way about his son. Well, maybe maybe Earl Woods did in talking about Tiger Woods. Let's uh, go to Steve in Knoxville. Steve, welcome to the program and good afternoon. Hey, Paul, how you doing? We are doing great. Thank you. Yeah, I was uh, hanging around uh, Knoxville and Nayland Stadium this weekend, and uh, I was kind of wondering myself something you said about Jeremy Pruitt talking about these fans, and, you know, I was a little surprised. In fact, I thought the turnout was actually really good for an orange and white game. It didn't break the Guinness Book of World Records, which they had before, but Jeremy, yeah, I think you're right. He's going to have to uh, – I mean, Knoxville is the easiest town in the world to do people in, okay? We'll take it forever. But, Steve, but, let's you know, see, the, see, they announced 60-something some, thousand. I mean, let, let's say conservatively there were 50,000 people there, which uh, 50,000 people or 40,000 or 60, it doesn't matter. That's still a lot of people for a spring game. Um, I, I, I do, and I haven't talked to Jeremy Pruitt, and I, and I wish he would clarify his comments if he feels like he was taken out of context. I, I, I think they worked hard, uh, at least the school did, because we, we had Jeremy on and we were instructed, hey, ask him uh, about the spring game. We want a big crowd. Um, yeah, sure you want a bigger crowd because it helps your product. But overall, I think it came off, and, and some of the coaches with whom I spoke to last night in Atlanta – we're all very critical of him now, privately, I might add. But I, I think you come you, you really ought to thank the fans who showed up. Don't ever bite the hand that feeds you when you're a football coach. Yeah, that's kind of stopped feeding you as much as it used to. Because, exactly. I mean, Knoxville's been through a disaster for 20 years, and we're just tired. And you come in here and start giving us a hard time, I mean, you know, you're right. I just wonder if he was trying to fire the fan base up, okay, but it seemed to backfire a little bit because, you know, we're going to have to see a football team for once, I think. You know, when when the fans stopped leaving, I mean, you used to get packed that stadium with 100,000 people in a losing season, not so much anymore. No, and, and, and by the way, thanks for the call, Steve. Uh, embrace your fans. Uh, and and, and I, I asked Jeremy Pruitt this question. What did he do to try to enhance the crowd? Did he do anything special? Or did he just expect people to show up to watch a product which has not been very good in recent years? Put a good product on the field and the fans will follow. I've spent four years of my life in Knoxville. They will support a winner. They'll support a, uh, they'll support a team that fights hard. Just let the PR people and the marketing people and the ticket people worry about the crowds. You worry about getting Tennessee back to a legitimate bowl game again. How about that, Jeremy? You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Matt is next up in Georgia. How is Atlanta, Paul? I I, I tell you what, uh, I think you know my affinity for Birmingham because I live there uh, a great deal. But I'm I'm getting pretty close to equal affinity for the city of Atlanta. I think that's uh, becoming one of my favorite place. places. Yeah, Atlanta's a great place. It's a great place. Uh, a couple things. Um, and you can be surprised what I'm going to say here, but I feel bad for Jalen Hurts. I, I'm tired of these, these fathers and extreme case point example, Lonzo Ball's dad or whatever his name is. I mean, what? You can coach your son. You can prepare your son. But let your son do the talking you don't have to go out and make comments because it puts so much pressure on the kid to live up to it he didn't have to say that you know i mean he just needs to shut up and let Jalen be Jalen. i mean it just makes it harder for Jalen to go i agree totally with you yeah i mean uh 
you know, it, it's just. And then I mean, and and what? And you look at the ball kid in, in L.A. I mean, look what it's just guys destroy. I mean, he's destroying his kids. The second thing I got to say is I'm gonna keep reiterating this point. And you you went on the other day and you said, yeah, Matt, you, I asked around about Athens and you're not you're not you're not the idiot we think you are, or whatever you said. But I can tell you from firsthand knowledge, and a lot of people in Athens, Jeremy Pruitt has a temperament, a bad temperament. He would have gotten fired the year Mark Rick got let go if they weren't didn't have intentions of letting Mark Rick go. If things don't go Jeremy Pruitt's way, he gets very volatile. Kevin Butler said he Kevin Butler came out and said publicly that after the Georgia Florida game, Jeremy's last year, that he had never seen a coach or a personnel act the way he did. And this is another point, case and example of Jeremy Pruitt. I mean, sixty-five thousand for University of Tennessee spring game to me, considering the product they put out, is awesome. He ought to be praising those fans because as soon as he wins ten ball games, that place will be packed. So you know, uh, you know, I'm just telling you, I don't. I think Jeremy's got a big temperament problem. I think you're going to come come see it out. And uh, Georgia did great on sa- on Saturday, 82,000 plus. You know, I was picking on Alabama, but Alabama still had seven thousand plus. So you know, and it's crazy. It's awesome that the SEC has that num- those strong numbers for spring games. Nobody in the country, I think Nebraska had more than ninety thousand. But this it just says a lot about the SEC. But uh, I'll shut up now, Paul, and go dogs. Hey, yeah, listen, uh, Matt actually made some points there. <laughs> it was interesting. Um, first of all, I do believe most universities enhance their spring game numbers a little bit. Uh, I've read some accounts of the Tuscaloosa crowd, of the Knoxville crowd, where veteran journalists have said the uh, numbers looked a little more charitable than they were. But beside that, and that really is not the critical factor here, uh, you should be happy with whatever you get. Uh, that is not the head coach's job, and I think we made that point very clear. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. You're not worth a flip. War Daddy is up next in Knoxville. How are you, War Daddy? Hey, I'm doing great, Paul. Uh, I'm going to have to start calling in a little bit more. I, I got a KJB interrogation calling in on who's War Daddy Zach? Who are you? Hey, I mean, you leave this show for a couple weeks and we have six new people working the board. Yeah, what about that? That's okay, though. You know, I call in when I got something to say and when I don't, I sit back and listen and laugh and enjoy myself. But, uh, Paul, I got to I weigh in on this Jeremy Pruitt thing and, and another thing that kind of bothered me. Listen, I'm, I'm behind Jeremy Pruitt. He's what we need, he's no nonsense. Uh, I, I believe in time he'll get us on the right track. Uh, but quite frankly, I, I, I would like to believe that if the guy had the chance to to do that segment over, he would reword what he said. I really believe he was he was really trying to get after his team because if you read the whole context, he was talking about how some players out there quit and he was disappointed with them, how they didn't compete, and he wound up working that in with the fan base. Now, I heard this yesterday, Paul, on the Sports Source with John Pennington here locally. And you correct me if it's wrong, Paul. Back in, was it 2003 that the Crimson Tide was coming off a, a losing season, like a four-loff season? Does that sound right? Uh, well, 2003, they would be coming off of a 10-win season. Okay, well, I must have misunderstood that. The, year, the, 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 of- the, the next year, they would be coming off of a nine-loss season. Okay, that must have been it. And they were pointing out how that the following spring game, the A-Day game, they had a little over 30,000 people in the stands. I think that's that right. For a spring game. And, and and it's just like Jeremy just did not register the fact this is a program wandering in the desert, been through more coaches uh, that, than Carter's got liver pills. And uh, yet these people, they, you know, announced at 60-something thousand. Let's say it was 45. That's fine. I mean, uh, they were there, uh, they, they were enjoying themselves, and uh, he just got a little negative, and, and, and it struck me the wrong way. But, Paul, don't you think if he had to do it over again, he would, he would reword well, that? Well, you know, I don't know. I, I mean, that, that's why I, I would, you know, no one's asking me. I don't work for the University of Tennessee, but, you know, 
it's Tuesday now. This has been going on since four o'clock on Saturday. It seems like right. uh, you got a lot of smart people to work there. The, the, there's been all this conversation about it. Why not correct the record if that's not what he meant? Well, that's a good point. That's a fair point. Now, I, I guarantee you, I would have to think that Philip Palmer had to call him aside at some point and say, Jeremy, you're my boy. I, I'm behind you. You're doing it the right way, but you don't want to start criticizing our fan base. They've been see, there for See, here, here's the problem, Ward, Daddy, and, and we're now talking on Tuesday afternoon. You've I, I've read articles about it. You've listened to talk shows about it, and it's – it's getting late in the day to correct the record. And as this story gets passed along, I was on a show yesterday. They said, Hey, what about Jeremy Pruitt calling out the fans? And the, yeah. and, and that's not exactly true. It's not really cl- close to being true, as you said, but that becomes the narrative. And, and, right. and that's, that's why, uh, you know, someone, uh, someone listening right now, it's not like we're not on, uh, some television set at, <laughs> at, 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 in the in the football office, you know, suggest that yeah. he he makes a you know issue a statement. I, do whatever you want to do. I don't care. Um, well, I, but but don't don't think, le, don't let it fester if it's not true. Is all I'm saying. Yeah, I, I, that's a great point, Paul. Listen, I know he's a non no nonsense type of guy, and we do need that. Okay, but uh, at, at the same token. Uh, I think coming from Nick Saban, and if you've been around Nick Saban and he's your mentor, Nick can say anything he wants to about fans. He's talked about fans leaving the game early. Oh, yeah. He's been critical of them. But he's Nick Saban. Well, he's earned the right to do yeah, it. I mean, by the way, I, I thought he was completely wrong when he called out the fans a couple of years ago. But, you know, trying to argue uh, down Nick Saban, you might as well give up because, the, I mean, you, I mean, listen, I, I've used more extreme examples, but. No matter what Saban says, there's a hundred thousand people that will call in and defend him. Yeah, and, and and Jeremy Pruitt needs to know this. You know, the opening game. You know, even over in Charlotte against West Virginia, Big Orange Nation will be there in in grand numbers. You can count on that. Sure. And then in the open game, there'll be one or two four fifty five there. And Jeremy just needs to realize that Tennessee fans were were aching, were hurting for for a winner for a team that goes out there and at least shows us they're going to fight for victory, fight for championships, and he won't have to worry about who's in the stands. No, no, you're, you're going to be there. You're, I, I know that, Ward. Hey, great to hear from you again. We're up against a break. We need to rush uh, out of here because when we come back, call your friends. I hear the siren about to blast off. There's a Tammy alert. She's next. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Put a little cherry on the top. Tammy is next. Tammy? Paul? Yes? Hey, I want to comment on this Tennessee thing because you know good and well that that coach that they got now came from Alabama, right? Under Nick Saban. Mm hmm. Okay. So why is it that he can talk about the fans? He can do this and he can do that, but. When Nick Saban did it, nobody said anything. So how about you telling me why everybody's making a big deal about it because the Tennessee coach has something to say? Well, because, Tammy, the, answer, the, answer, is really, yeah, the answer is easy. What is it? He's not Nick Saban. He's not out The answer is that, that the media is prohibited from criticizing Nick Saban. It is simply verboten. Well, I'm here to tell you that that man up there can say what he wants. He's the head coach. And if he wants to say what he wants to say about the fans, he can say what he wants to say about the fans. He wants more people there. That's what he wants. And the reason he said what he said because you ain't going to get no more people there if he ain't got them boys quit playing. He just told you why. The fans, the boys quit playing. The boys on the Tennessee team quit. So if they can't, if the boys quit and they won't play, how does he think he's going to get his fans in there to represent the school that he's to Tammy, my, for? Tammy, my question to you, and this is maybe a better, a better, why do you care about any of this? Because I, I because y'all sitting up here criticizing this coach wanting him to come on here. He ain't got to do nothing except uh, coach them boys is quitting. That's all he's got to do is coach them boys is quitting. Because of one thing, if he was involved with the coach and them boys was quitting. Hey, hey Tammy, uh, may, I, may I ask you a question? Uh, Tammy, come on. Do I, may I ask you a question? Ask me a question. You Tam- ask me anything 
you want okay. to I, 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 I heard from you uh, at the end of last season after the Georgia win and after the Alabama win, but I did not hear from you after the Georgia loss and the UCF loss. Can you explain those two games? Yeah. Our boys quit. War damn eagle. Make me sick. <laughs> You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Philip is in Georgia, and you're on the air. Hey, Philip. Hey, Paul. How you doing? We are doing great. Thank you for the call. Well, I'm on a little bit of a hot streak lately. I, that, I've been calling the show for about ten years, and finally got on with Peter Burns last week, and really enjoying that. But I want to talk about your mock draft of callers. Yes. What about it? I feel like you need to do, you need to expand. You quit dealing with Tammy and all them and get some new, fresh callers. I agree. Really expand your ratings and let's get it going. I, I want to be that caller. You know, I have to be honest, uh, and, and everywhere I go, people ask me about Tammy. And, and I, I know this will sound disgrace, uh, dis- uh, maybe uh, I don't appreciate her more or disappointed, but I just don't think uh, Tammy is really that good of a caller. <laughs> well, I and she Tammy. screams, I uh, and she can be funny sometimes, but there was no redeeming quality in that call she just had. I mean, that was that was like, uh, I mean, if you rank that compared to Jim from Tuscaloosa, that was like Jim Jim's 987th best call. Uh, yeah, well, I enjoyed it because she's worried about Tennessee spring game having 65,000 people and Auburn had about 19. I'm a Georgia fan. <laughs> and she's worried about that. She needs to worry about how Georgia whipped, whipped their butts in SEC championship. She needs to concentrate on that. Not That's a good about point. Fan. Well, I'll tell you what, Philip. I think you've got a shot to make the list. Keep going. Uh, well, well, you kind of stumped me there. Yeah, well, that's not. By the way, that, that did not help. I mean, a good caller has to be versatile. Um, unless your name is Daryl, where no matter what the host throws at him, he's sticking to the same script. Daryl is up next. What do you say, Daryl? Uh, absolutely. I would say that, in my opinion, Tammy's had one signature call in her career, and that was the SEC mascots. And that's pretty much it. I mean, you just nailed exactly what you did. I mean, I mean uh, listen, I feel like you're a pretty good connoisseur of callers. You've been around. I mean, wouldn't you agree with me that she really is somewhat of a one-trick pony? I couldn't have said it any better, Paul. She screams and she can be funny at times. But at that time, she can go major overboard with stuff, too. I mean, you know, but, you know, she is who she is. Uh, Paul, I told the backers a long time ago. I said, I guarantee you one thing right off the bat. Jalen Hurts would never play on Sunday. Okay, he would never play on Sunday. Can you start? Can you start to see it, Paul? You start, can you? Can you get? You get yeah, that? Yeah, you know, listen. Uh, I, I have been in his camp for a long time, and I'm not. I'm not going to judge or define a career on a spring game. But if you can't get it together in a spring game, when are you going to be able to get it together? Yeah, I know, but you know what. Alabama's always, they never had to, all of a sudden now, they got to depend on stellar quarterback play. Never been the issue before, just a game manager, all we needed, and we can roll, okay? It's changing, okay? That's a sign right there. Now they're requiring stellar quarterback play to be able to win. I'm telling you, man, it's, 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 that, that is another sign. But, if, but if, Jeremy, Darryl, if you study the big games Alabama has had in the last couple of years under Jalen Hurts, it, it's been it's been a uh, roller coaster ride every time, and I think Nick Saban's tired of that. Jalen Hurts is good with his legs, okay, but he's not going to beat you with his arms. You no. play him the same way Georgia played. You make him throw the football, and that, that right there puts you in the you know. Better so, than hey, tell me, know. tell me this, Daryl, because I'm uh, and I realize he did, he only showed so much, but from insiders in Athens, I'm hearing the moon is the is the goal is, is the is the potential for Fields. What about you? Well, I'll tell you like this, Paul. Like I said, I told um, Peter Bird yesterday, spring games, okay, first of all, um, Jake, it was, you know, the ones went up against the ones. Our fields did not have to go up against the number one. No, defense. no, that's true. But that's, but that's not advantage. it, though. I mean, I'm, I'm talking to people that know that program, and I'm hearing unbelievably complimentary things about this young man. Because he went out there in one spring game and went up against a second No, team. no, I mean, no, you, you didn't listen to me. Uh, forget the spring game. I'm just talking about day to day. 
We will see. I mean, Scott, who knows? Paul, tweet him well, and find uh, out. Uh, listen, uh, uh, people know. Enough, you know, you got to, I want to see him in a big time game. I mean, you know, they, 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 I, I'm You'll not see him. sold on him yet because I haven't seen enough of him. Well, to really, but, but you know, Daryl, once again, you're not, you haven't listened to a word I said. I'm talking about what? people who are there, who watch him practice, who watch him, uh, who watch his demeanor. They, they watch him. Around. I mean, he's only been there a couple of months, but they're still seeing in him things that these people have not seen in a long time, if ever, on that campus. I'm just telling well, you. Well, you know what? I'm not going to beat that drum, okay, because I learned from Auburn, okay, about beating drums we're, like that. You know we're trying to hype it. Though. We're trying to hype <laughs> yeah. you into this, Daryl. Uh-uh. And then, it, <laughs> then you quote back a little bit like Johnson did for Auburn if all stayed on his face, and I hope you not. I'm not, you know, you gotta earn, he's going to have to earn. Jay, let me say it like this. Jay Fry will be the start at Georgia for as long as he's healthy, okay? He will be, uh, especially for this year. I, I mean, Phil's going to get playing time, but he's still got to earn his stripes. But I don't put a. I want to say this about Jeremy Pruitt. Tennessee people need to understand one thing, okay, with Jeremy Pruitt. What you see is what you get, okay? If you got a problem with somebody that, that doesn't mind speaking their mind, and you, it, you know, it, you're, you're not going to like Jeremy Pruitt. You don't, you don't have to worry about where you stand with him. He will let you know, but I'll tell you one thing. He was a defensive coordinator on the national championship team at Florida State. He was a defensive coordinator on the national championship team at Alabama. He knows what it takes to win. And you just need to let him do his thing because I think he can have some success up there. I really don't want him to see him have any success. But this ain't no a, 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 a dog and pony show like they had with Bush Jones. He ain't going to be nicey, nicey. He ain't going to impact you and tell you how great you are. He's going to expect things out of you. And that's just the way he is. I mean, he's cut and dry. And I kind of like that, but that's just exactly how he is. Now, I want to say one more thing real, too, real quick, too. I heard Phyllis call in last week about Jim, okay? And I want to ask you this. Jim is no doubt. I, you know, I like Jim. I, you know that. I think Jim's always been a very important part of the show. But the thing I don't get with Jim, and I don't, I don't, I want you to help me understand why Jim doesn't get this. What does it matter how old you are? What does it matter what people say about you that don't well, you know, know you? You know what? something, Daryl. How many times have you heard me talk to Jim? I try to help him, but he won't listen because he's too stubborn. He's too obstinate. Every time he talks about him not being old, he gets 10 years older. And you know what? When you get mad about it, all you're doing is playing right into yeah, their he does, not, he, he does not understand Silence that. Silence is what kills. Silence. Let me, let me get on you. There, there is I mean, not, I, but, Daryl, there is not one person watching this show who cares how old Jim is. Exactly. I mean, no one cares. They don't care if he's 16 or 86. And these people don't even know you. Why would you care about what somebody thinks that doesn't know you? I mean, if you you put yourself out there on the What Jim needs to do is to go back and listen to old Jim tapes from 10, 15 years ago when he was actually a good caller to the show as opposed to a caricature of his former self. Well, when he gives you a hard time about not defending him, I wish he would. I wish he would like just understand. That it's, you know, it's your job to let callers say whatever they want to say. Sure it is. That's that, I mean, your job to, to manage the show and doing that. I mean, you know, that's that's. He can't, I don't see how he can he can expect something like that. That's a little. A little, a little, a little well, but, you know, again, Daryl, you've you've never been a narcissist, have you? This is what Jim needs to understand. Okay, a old wise man once told me this. Okay. I hate to say he graduated from Tennessee, but he once told me this. It doesn't matter what they're saying as long as they're saying something. See you, Paul. Got it. Good stuff. (laughs) You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Squirrel is on the the phone. Hello, Squirrel. Hey, how are you doing today? Uh, Okay. I'm really disappointed in Tammy's call. Uh, She she bailed on you. I mean, first question you asked, boom, she was gone. So, yeah, I hear she's a Mississippi girl now. I think you're right about that. I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I think she, it's fun to talk to her, but uh, that was a yeah. That was that was a, a typical over late late season late stage Tammy call. Bad. Well, she'll be calling back in a few months talking about how Auburn's going to win the national championship this, this yeah. coming fall. So you know, just just around the corner. <laughs> and um, it was ironic. I heard you mentioning. Uh, Jim and some controversy about Jim's age and things of that nature. Well, I just said I don't know why Jim cares what anyone thinks. You're exactly right, uh, and, and nobody cares about anybody's age on this show. What's What's so funny about Jim is that he lies about it, and we catch him in lies over and over again. 
And that's just what's kind of amusing. And <clears throat> speaking of being amusing, I had a poll last week, and I asked a simple question. Based on his voice alone, nothing you've heard about him uh, hanging out with Joe Namath and parking Rocky Marciano's car and things of that nature. <laughs> <laughs> Based on his voice alone, how old do you think Jim is? And I, I got 200 votes. I mean, so, not 199, not 201. We got 200 votes. And what were, what, what, what were the results? Well, there was four categories, uh, age 40 to 49, 50 to 59, 60 to 69, or 70 above. I'm going to ask you those four questions, then I'm going to tell you the answer. Out of the 40 to 49, out of 200 votes, how many th- do you think you got for the 40 to 49 range? No, the question again was, Squirrel? How old do you think Jim oh, is? Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to say... Like fine bomb family okay, um, among 40 to 49, I'm going to say... Uh, is there out a specific... 200 votes. Is there a specific... So what... what I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure out I understand. Out of 200 votes, no, we I, had four categories, 40 to 49. Oh, 50, oh, 59, oh, I get it. I, I'm sorry. 69 and 70 and above. Out of uh, the 40 to 49, out of 200 votes, how many do you think voted for age 40 to 49? None. Zero. Okay, age 50 to 59, how many do you think voted for? None. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's easy. 60 to 69, how many voted for him in that age? You know, this is where in Vegas you're supposed to cash in your chips, but I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm tripling down. I'm going to say none. Zero, and so that means 200 for the 70 or above. I can't believe it. Uh, I, won. I won the lottery. You were close. You were close. The actual results are... 40 to 49 out of 200 votes, four people thought he was in the 40 to 49 range. Okay. Jim probably was one of those votes, so that means three <laughs> actual people. Hey, Squirrel, stop mumbling. Nobody cares about your stupid polls. I mean, do you have any subject besides Is knocking the village home Jim idiot or other from voters? Georgia? Is yeah, the, the village, village idiot. idiot yeah, Georgia? the guy named Squirrel, Madison, Mississippi. Oh, my God. I mean, do you have any subject other than to cut down Why, why did Jim? you block Seriously. me, Matt? Matt, why did huh? you block me? Because I'm tired I, I of asked you the stupid simple question. polls. I asked you one simple you question. Do you even root for a college wife? football team? I mean, me? you're an idiot, dude. I you, you sit here football. and back. Hey, hey, listen, uh, yeah. I'm going to say this again. The only way we can do this is if, if, if uh, okay, one of you speaks. Ahead. Let, 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 ahead, let squirrel, let squirrel. No, 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 you jumped on my call, Matt. Go ahead. No, you go first there. Okay, Squirrel, go ahead and respond. To what? To this idiot? <laughs> I mean, what do you want me to respond to? He's a buffoon. I mean, I, I was in the you middle can't. of a you very no serious stuff. scientific poll here. Oh, yeah. Scientific. But go ahead, Matt. What, what's, what's on your mind, Matt? Scientific. I mean, scientific. Hey, uh, let me, let, Matt, Matt, let me ask you a question here. Uh, why are you so defensive of Jim? I'm not defensive of Jim. What I'm saying is, is I'm t- sick and tired of Squirrel. He brings no subject to the show. All he does, he calls about a poll bashing on the guy who we don't know if he can help himself or not. I've talked about other on, things, Matt. I've talked about what, fishing. What? I've talked about um, movies. Uh, you know, I've talked about sports this occasions. Ain't, this ain't a movie show, but this is the SEC oh, okay. Network. We Look, talk I don't about need football. you to tell me what kind of show it is, Matt. I don't need some newcomer stepping up in here and telling me what I can talk who about. Do about. Who do you root for? Who do you root for? Who do I root for? It's none of your damn business who I root for. <laughs> Why but, are you um, calling an SEC network if you don't have a team? You, I mean, I do have team a team, Matt. I, 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 do you want to know Jim who is right, Matt? Jim would probably I, I, kick your butt. What, what was that? <laughs> who would kick my butt? Jim would probably kick your butt. I mean, <laughs> man, I, you, you he probably would because I couldn't hit Jim. Because who, I don't we don't even know if he's a Matt, would you, Matt, would you allow uh, Squirrel to respond? Yeah. Okay, let respond, me respond. Squirrel nuts. Okay, shut up for a minute, and I will, Matt. Jesus Christ. I, uh, I, I've been a lifelong Alabama fan. I've met, Al, I've met Bear Bryant, shook his hand, had dreams of playing for Bear Bryant, wow. but I didn't have the let talent me, let me to play for Bear Bryant. Did you grow up in Mississippi? Will you right? shut up for a minute, Matt? Let did me you finish. grow up in Mississippi? No, I did not. And I, uh, grew Why up in are you there now? Because you're, you're making the state of Fort Worth play. Minute. Oh, Matt, 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 listen, you, Matt, allow, allow Squirrel to answer the question. <laughs> okay, come on, jump on the call. I mean, let somebody answer this question, or do you just want to hear yourself? But like I said, no, Matt, I've been a lifelong. I'm going to come over to Georgia and slap you if you don't shut up. Bring I've been it, a big boy. I've been <laughs> a lifelong Alabama fan. I grew up just outside of Knoxville. So coached at Tennessee games as a child, but I was never a Tennessee fan. 
played for East Tennessee State. Uh, my kids go to Ole Miss, so I pull for Ole Miss now. What now? You tell me about you, Matt. Other than your little flimsy Georgia career, uh, what, what, I mean, uh, well, anything I high, uh, great about career. Matt? Well, I, I I've got a name, and it ain't yeah. squirrel nuts, and I okay. have shit all over the South. Great. I actually grew up in the state of Georgia. I pulled That's for awesome. the team I grew up. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't grow up in Knoxville. Well, man, you didn't have any athletic ability, man. So you didn't have. Yeah, the ability you're right. I just played college golf for fun, right, buddy? Yeah, no what athletic was, ability, right, Squirrel Nuts? I don't know, I mean, really. I don't, I don't care. Really, Squirrel? It's I mean, that's what you do. You, that, that's my point, is you bash people. You just sit here and cut people out. I bash out. people? You bring, yeah, you bring, bash, you bash on Jim on your stupid phone. No, just idiots you like bash, you, man. bash, 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 bash. Okay, bring thank you. Bring substance to the show. Do you have any credibility about No, anything? I have no substance. I, 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 you I don't? Have no you're substance, right. Matt. We've determined that. You're like a I'm not on here for squirrel. substance. That's why Matt, I it's not about me, Matt. I haven't sent my picture into the Fine Bomb show like you have, Matt. Okay? If I was that damn egotistical, I'd already have a picture up there, okay? Egotistical. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm... Yeah, exactly. You're, you don't send your picture into the Fine Bomb show because you're scared Jim will whip your butt. Yeah, because let me it. tell you something. You, you if, I, it, if someone talks, hey, if you someone it, talks, thank you. Thank you. Okay, 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 guys. Like well, listen, I, I, I hate, I, would, I hate to interrupt, um, but thanks to both of you for making us all a little less intelligent. You are listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. You're not worth a thrill. We were talking during our break about the importance of spring football attendance, and our next guest has written about that for the Atlantic. He should know quite a bit about spring attendance because not only does he live in Alabama, he teaches uh, in addition to his writing at the University of Alabama. It's been way too long since we've uh, checked in with Lars Anderson. Lars, how are you, my man? Hey, it's great to be with you, my old friend. How are you? We are doing great. And, you know, it's interesting because uh, I, I referenced 90, uh, the, the 92,000 that showed up at Saban's first spring game. And uh, you know that because you've probably heard Saban say this so many times, how important that was to what has happened since. Uh, put this all into perspective for us. Well, I, if I recall correctly, I think you were there, too. I, I was, and it just – it felt like a big game atmosphere and it was something that uh those of us who live in alabama had experienced uh for a long long time and not only was you know was i there but julio jones was there mark Barron was there courtney upshaw was there mark ingram was there barrett jones was there marcel darius was there dante hightower was there and terrence cody was there and those were the guys who ended up forming saban's first real recruiting class in 2008 became the backbone of the team that would win the national title in, in 2009 and and just set the stage for the dynasty. And every every recruit who was there, every fan who was there remembers just the the electricity of the environment and big crowds attract big time attention from recruits. There's no doubt about it. And, um, you know, you, you saw this, the same dynamic happen this year at Nebraska where 86,000 showed up. Yeah, and it remains to be seen whether Frost can even come close to replicating what Nick Saban has done. I, I, I certainly think it was, that's, a, that's a very tall task. But he can use that momentum and, and carry that into recruiting because, you know, when you have these 17-year-old kids on visits, uh, standing on the sidelines and just looking up, up, and up, and seeing nothing but fans for what is it, what is a, a practice, they can't help but be impressed. And and it's the it's the passion of the fan base, I think, that really is the root of successful programs. And I thought it was impressive too that Georgia was able to attract eighty two thousand uh, to their spring game, uh, second largest crowd this year. And even Alabama, after all the winning, still had nearly 75,000. So, again, I, it's not I, – I know a lot of people think that the size actually doesn't matter of the spring game crowds, but I, I would argue that it does because it's, it's a reflection of just the uh, intensity of the, of the fan base, and it makes kids want to come and play at that school. Talking to Lars Anderson, uh, Lars, let's get a little bit deeper because uh, today, uh, unlike some years when recruits could show up, now 
they can show up officially on these spring games. Does that play an even bigger role into what's going on on these spring Saturdays? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and, and I know that, that Saban caters the whole day around the recruits. You know, he's and I'm sure you know this, he he has a reception at his house following the game. And, and I've written about this in, in books and in stories of how his, the ultimate closer is Miss Terry, his wife, and, and Miss Terry will – she will get some one-on-one time with the recruits at their house uh, after the after the spring game, and it's just a, it's a whole it's just a whole experience, a whole weekend experience for uh, these kids to get on campus, interact with the other students, uh, get tours of the campus, get tours of all the facilities, and and to cap it off with uh, you know a, a huge crowd at a spring game, and then and then an evening at the Saban's house. Uh, it's it's a, it's an impressive overall experience for these kids to have. A couple of things I want to throw at you, uh, Lars, because we haven't spoken lately uh, about Alabama and other schools, but in particular, you've you've written so much about Nick Saban for your uh, former job at Sports Illustrated and, and other uh, places as well. You're on that campus a lot. You know him. There, there's a big debate now about. How long will he stay? And, and there are whispers uh, that opponents are using in relation to his age. This is an old trick. Hasn't hurt him too much yet, I might add. But uh, what, what do you think? Uh, what's your best guess on his longevity at Alabama? I think he's got at least five more years. Uh, I, I do think, and this isn't based on necessarily any personal insight it's more of a a gut feeling and and talking to people who orbit around the program i do think that he thought about hanging it up after this last national championship i think it was a a brief moment maybe even a a talk that he had with miss terry and i think you know he very quickly came to the conclusion that he's not ready to step away yet um, his internal furnace is still at full blast. Um, he's still uh, just, just grinding out the long hours. And so I don't think he's going to be walking away anytime soon. And, and, and you know, we all saw his reaction to what was sort of reported about Kirby Smart and, and perhaps him using uh, Nick's age against him in, 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 the, in the battle over some recruits. And, and you know, the uh, the... Again, the, the fire is still there, very much so, and it it it, it, it is uh, is at full blast. And I also think he's concerned about how he would sort of be able to maintain that intensity once he stepped away from the game, because it's just been in and out. It's just been a part of him for so long that that every moment is sort of calculated and thought about and planned. And literally, he's a guy who who has to make hundreds of decisions each day, and that is something that's very hard to step away from. You know, my last book was with Bruce Arians, the former head coach of the Arizona Cardinals, and you know, Bruce and I had some discussions about whether or not he should retire at the end of the season because it's uh, and he ended up obviously retiring, but it's just so it's so hard to walk away from something you've worked all your life to get to the summit of your profession and again you're in charge of so much you have so much responsibility and everything you know is 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 just uh every day feels so important every hour feels important and then you go from that to just nothing it's a very hard transition and i don't think nick is ready to uh to make that yet or anytime soon Okay, Lars, it was such a great answer. I didn't want to interrupt, but uh, you're a journalism professor, and if I happened to be in your class, you would have scolded me if I didn't come back and follow up. And and even momentarily, if we could go back to one thing you said there, because I had not heard this before, you said Nick Saban, even perhaps for a moment, considered stepping away. He had a conversation. What what can you tell us about that? Because that's very, even if it was for five minutes, it's still very interesting. That again, this just comes, and I, I tried to be clear about this. This comes from not, not any direct knowledge from Nick or Miss Terry. It's from talking to people who, who, as I said, orbit in their universe, and that they believe that Nick actually did take some time to think about it, because going out on top on perhaps the greatest play in college football history, you can make that argument, uh, the, the biggest comeback 
and and you know Nick sort of uh, making all the right moves there at the end to win the national title. I think the question was, can it get any better than this? Is this is this the appropriate time? And again, I, I don't know if it was just for a, a very brief amount of time that he thought about it, but I do think, according to the people I've talked to, it was something briefly, briefly considered. And ultimately, uh, again, uh, I think that is the way in the rearview mirror now, and I believe that he is going to be there for at least five more years. Well, but it, it, it would be common sense, though, so uh, even for 10 minutes or 20 minutes or 24 hours to have that conversation, because you're right, Lars. If you go out on that, you've, you've tied Bear, Bear Bryant. Uh, no one's ever going to debate uh, you're the greatest coach in college football history, and your ending was as good as we have ever seen. Before you go, uh, and I know this is very Alabama-centric, but, I, but you, uh, you know what the debate is right now, and it's one of the most uh, – controversial conversations that, we, that we've had in a while about a quarterback situation, the Jalen Hurts situation, now with his father saying what he did the other day. Uh, everyone seems to have an opinion. What is your sense? Well, uh, Jalen certainly didn't do himself any favors in the spring game. I mean, he got outplayed by a third-string quarterback who most of us have never even heard of before. And uh, it sounded like a hot mic uh, caught Nick uh, having not so kind words for Jalen on the field after Jalen took off on a run when Nick wanted him to, to, to throw the ball. And I also go back to something that Bruce Arian has hammered home to me when we're working on the book. By the time a kid is 19 or about 19, 20 years old, you absolutely can't teach him touch or accuracy anymore. It's either has it or he doesn't. And it's clearly, it's clear that Jalen just doesn't have that. You could give Jalen 50 chances to make that throw that Tua did to win the national title, and Jalen probably couldn't hit it uh, maybe once out of 50 just because of the of the arc it, it, it needed to have, just the right pace and everything, the timing to beat the safety, getting over to the wide receiver. And Jalen, that's just not who Jalen is. And I think his dad also didn't do him any favors by making those public statements to Matt Hayes at Bleacher Report right before the game because it looked like that put more pressure on Jalen. And he looked to me like a quarterback whose confidence has been broken. Uh, It looked like he actually regressed from from the last few starts of of last season. And so I I personally think it's going to be Tua. And I know that that is not the sort of widely held opinion in Alabama right now, but I think the starter will be Tua. Uh, I don't think Jalen will transfer this year. I wouldn't be surprised if he transferred next year after if he earns his degree uh, and graduates early, which I think he's on pace to do so he could could move without having to sit out. But uh, I think Saban's going to go with Tua this year. Lars, it has uh, been too long, and in, uh, in listening to you, it, it won't be that long again. It's just great, great to catch up. Such uh, substantive information. We really appreciate it. Be well, my friend. All right. Thank you, Paul. Take care. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Put a little cherry on the top. Larry, what do you think about all this? Good afternoon. I think it's uh, crazy. I think it's a bunch of loony bugs. I think it's, uh, you know, going after a quarterback. This, man, just a day game, you know. I but but would, you, would you not agree, though, Larry, that if you look at Jalen against – LSU against Clemson against Auburn games that really mattered he doesn't perform nearly as well against them as he does against most of the high school teams that he plays uh, from non-conference and others you got that I'm agreeing with you Paul yeah. and you know that's hard for me to do I mean I agree with you he looked terrible Saturday I just look he looked like he was sleepwalking and Big Ten John now has ruled me as his little, uh, he had one of them little things that what um, that Peter Barnes had set up yesterday, amnesty, and he has ruled me as one of the worst callers. John you know, John Hayes has, so, yeah. Uh, John, is that accurate? Uh, Larry, you clearly have not seen the fine bomb caller mock draft one point oh. And, and Big Ten John said I was terrible, and that. Uh, he wanted. He actually got tried to get two amnesties. That little green. Now, now Larry, thing. Larry, uh, can you spell amnesty? <laughs> can we go on? Let, let me spell it at the end. 
Can we spell amnesty? A m e s t i y. A m. Hold on one second, Larry. Uh, I want to make oh, sure. Okay. I, I want to make sure. I, I, I think I'm pretty uh, sure I know how to spell it. But uh, give me the, give me the spelling again, Larry. I want to put it in my computer here and see what amnesty. Amnesty. A m e s t i f y. Amnesty. A m amnesty. Okay, Larry. I'm going to spot you the A. Okay. A m right. E s t amnesty. No, no. I'm going to spot you, Larry. I'm going to help you here. A. This is a weird word. A m n. A M N. That's how it starts. A M N. A M N E S T A Y. Amnesty. <laughs> right? Uh, wrong. Larry, uh, I'm going to give you the A M N E S T, okay? E Y. Uh, amnesty. A M N E S T Y. E Y. 19th trial. Larry got it right. All right, thank you, baby. So who's the bad caller now, Jack? How about you, Big Ten, John? Larry, I'm living in your head, buddy. I said that on the show yesterday because I knew you were watching and you'd stir about it all night long and call the show upset. You're not a bad caller if you're number three in the mock draft. And that's the problem. And that right there puts it into perspective, Larry. The 1.0 came out. uh, You ranked in the top three, but by tomorrow you are dropping in the first round, my friend. Maybe out of the top ten. Oh, oh, it's all now. Oh, it's all that. And all you're doing this for is just a crawfish. Your ass yeah, you out know, of that Larry, I, 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 Larry, Larry, crawfish. Larry, 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 hold on a second. I, I, I really don't like what I hear. I mean, you and John sound like two little kids that just keep going back and forth and back and forth. I mean, you need to settle this either. Intellectually, the golf course, he won't go on the golf course because he's a buck, 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 chicken man. Chicken man. Him and Mark both are chicken men. I didn't mean Mark was ugly, and like the other guy judging you and your underwear. I ain't judging Mark in his underwear. I don't care what happened, but I will say Mark just says ugly things. Now you and the underwear guy, that's a different story. Who's but the underwear I, guy? That said you look good in your underwear. Somebody who said, did. Who? Who? I, I did. Mm-hmm. Where, where did yeah. someone? Where did someone see me in my underwear? Oh, uh, what's his name? Matt. Matt has he seen me. He, he said he looked good. He said I think Paul's a handsome man that looks good. In his well, underwear. I mean, there 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 is that uh, commercial shoot I did last year that never got published, but I guess he must have seen the prints. Hey, hey that boy, look here, and you be careful, Paul. <laughs> That boy might be trying to break up your marriage, boy. Watch him. But I, anyways, I don't think that, that Mark's ugly like ugly. He says ugly things about Bama. Okay, Larry. Me. Okay, Larry. Once again, okay. once, once again, what, once again, no like Jalen, you you failed in your chance to improve your your lot. Thank you for the call. You are listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. Uh, Nick is up next in Florida. I think we talked. Nick, are you the guy we talked to a couple weeks ago from the Big Ten? Paul, I certainly am. How are you, man? Did you make a, Did you make a splash here on your virginal call to the program? We're gonna wipe your butts this year and okay. smoke them. <laughs> that, oh man, you know what, Paul? I woke up the next day. I was on the internet uh, on my on my news feed, my Google feed from uh, two four seven Sports said. Epic Ohio State fan has a call on Paul Feinbaum show. You made it. You made it big time. I well, let's not get carried away. You know. Okay, but, I, I, I tend to exaggerate. You are correct. <laughs> How you doing, man? We are doing great. Well, I saw that story, and uh, we tend to see whatever people are saying about us, and we, we got a, we got a pretty pretty big chuckle out of that. Yeah, I mean, you know, you you're. Uh, your little uh, cohorts there in the booth that you go to on the side there, those those little guys who are uh, your yes men, they they had a big uh, field day with that. My uh, um, my yes men? What do you? Uh, we don't have yes men here. Those guys are entitled no, to say whatever on. they want to say. Well, I, I don't even know yes, who they are. are. Okay, you know well, I mean? uh, let me inter- let, let, let allow me to introduce you to them. Uh, 
Randy Heritage is on the right. If you're watching on TV, if you're listening, he's still Hello? on the right. Hello. And uh, Big well, Ten. It was, jo- a, it was another. It was another guy. Um, the last time. Uh, John Hayes was probably here, and you're, you're probably thinking of, of, of uh, heavy, heavy breathing. As we feel like, I feel like I'm on a 900 number here. Um, uh, the, the other guy was Mark Kubiak, probably. Yeah. Or Brams. I or, or Danny John Brams. Hayes, John Hayes brought up a good point. He said, why don't Ohio State and Alabama play? And he was right. I just wanted to call back and explain my situation and, uh, you know, I had a little too much to drink. I will admit that. And my... Uh, no, no, my, no, no, no. Hold on a second. You're telling me that a fine bomb caller was drinking while making a phone call to this show? Paul, I had the day off to my right as an American to do it basically whatever I want. So what? Uh, so if you don't mind, uh, what, what were you and how much were you drinking? I was uh, drinking pretty steadily. I'm not, I wasn't, uh, I was able to obviously take over 20 minutes of your show. Um, so I was doing pretty good. You know, I mean, not saying that in a braggadocio. How do you spell amnesty, by the way, Larry from Shelby, who you put on right after me? I'd like to meet Larry. If he can find his way out of the uh, trailer that he lives on that's jacked up on Cinderbox. Ooh. I'll meet him halfway. Making fun of people who uh, who live in mobile homes now, huh? It's not mobile when it's on cinder blocks, Paul. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of people. I have a lot of friends who who live in those homes because they they like they like the community that they live in, and that's uh, in their in their affordable price range. And what's wrong with that? I mean, you're making fun of people because uh, you know they can't take off a day and get drunk like you. He called me a hey boy. He said, hey boy, yeah, you come over here with that toilet paper. I'll let you wipe my butt. Yet he's talking to you about you and your underpants. Okay? If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't like 30 minutes ago, uh, they were talking about you, Larry specifically, was talking about you in your under, underwear? I think that's what he was is saying. You, yeah. is, that what you, is that what you Alabama fans do down there, Paul? I'm just curious. You know, Nick, listen, uh, where I come from, uh, we, we don't judge people by where they live. We judge we judge people by the content the, of their the character. The keys, Paul. Please, Good for you. Spare me. Spare say hello, me to the judgment. Say hello judgment to Ernest card. Hemingway if you see him out uh, walking his dog late at night. Now, my point <laughs> is that w- the most people that I know are, are good people. They don't call up radio shows drunk or sober. Frankly, you were funnier when you were uh, drunk. And... You know, disparage people because I mean, who appointed you uh, the poet laureate of this of this radio show? Can you explain that to me? Well, I mean, and by the way, uh, uh, Nick, and I'm not going to make fun of you if, if you're if you're high, if you're tied up to an oxygen tent. Uh, I feel, I, I mean, uh, my grandmother was many much of her late life as my mother was, but I mean, what's the deal with this heavy breathing, man? Well, you know, I'm uh, I'm on speakerphone. So. Oh, well, is is it possible that you could come off the speakerphone? You're on a national radio and television show here, bud. Or do you need I, it? Or, or you do you need your I hand? Your, or do you need your hands free while you're making this phone call? No, sir. You're you are correct, uh, and I respect what uh, you do. <laughs> uh, I, respect the, uh, I respect Paul Feinbaum as a uh, football guy. The oxygen, please. I just, do you think Larry knows where Nick Saban went to college? Do you think Larry has any idea where Nick Saban is from? And I got a lot of feedback. Well, you know, I, yeah, someone tells me that Nick Saban uh, is a snowbird. Larry they probably knows. Snowbird. Uh, okay, you know, you obviously know where Nick Saban's from, right? Of course I do. I'm from Cleveland. Of course I know where Nick Saban went to college and. Uh, so did Lou Holtz, and so did Joe Walsh of the Eagles, by the way. They wow. went to Kent State. And we're also four people yeah. were massacred by the, ten, uh, the ten, Ohio National Guard. Yeah, ten soldiers and Nixon's coming. I heard the song. That's right. Correct. But anyway, how about those Buckeyes? Are you ready for this? I, I mean, this is, I think this How about is, what this, Buckeyes? Uh, it doesn't happen. 
I mean, the Buc- I mean, listen, which Buckeyes do you want to talk about? The one with Ezekiel Elliott who choked away a national championship with the best team Urban Meyer will ever have in 2015, the 2016 version, which lost 31 to nothing to Clemson, or last year's version, which lost by 31 at Iowa. Which, which Buckeyes team would you like to talk about? Um... Well, I mean, if you want to go back and quote the past five years, like no, I just quoted the, I just quoted the last, I quoted the last three. Nick, Nick, let me let me just end here with with this uh, admonition. Try harder. Uh, this was a total fail, as your first call was. Adios, amigo. You're listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. We have a Southerner on board here. He is Cole Kublik, uh, the former star at Auburn. He now works for the SEC Network to start a new show on uh, WJOX in Birmingham. And uh, we're happy to have Cole on. Cole, how's the new show going? Good afternoon. Uh, doing well, Paul. It's great. A lot of fun. Enjoying being on in, in Birmingham in that market that I know you're very familiar with. Uh, but glad to be back with you. I appreciate it. Well, we appreciate it. We, we, we won't waste any time because uh, I'm sure on your program this week and uh, perhaps for many weeks to come, the question uh, sur- surrounds and, and revolves around Jalen Hurts. You, you cover this league. You do games every Saturday night. What gives? I think it's a, it's a, it's a story that's intriguing, and obviously uh, the, the storylines around it uh, continue to mount. I have been a guy that, that has been a supporter of Jalen Hurts. I've been very appreciative of what kind of football player that he's been for Alabama. I think there were things that he did the last two seasons that didn't involve throwing the football that a lot of fans didn't understand or didn't appreciate. It made that offense very difficult to defend. Uh, but I look at what's being stacked up against him now and with what Tua Tungavailoa came in and did in that national championship game, the fact that we didn't see – Tonga Vailoa be able to go out in the spring game, do well or not do well. The fact that his little brother commits to the school just before uh, the spring game kicks off and the fact that Jalen Hurts takes the field and, and looks very, uh, just did not look impressive at all, I think begins to point to the fact that uh, he potentially might not be a part of that roster. With what his father came out and said with Matt Hayes and Bleacher Report last week, uh, potentially naming him as the the biggest free agent in college football history when he's slated to graduate, the fact that he has a red shirt year still under his belt that he could take if need be. The young man has played quarterback in this league. He's been successful doing it. He knows what it's like. He understands that feeling. For him to take a back seat or not want to take a back seat would be understandable to me. The hard part for me, Paul, the thing that I struggle with is Jalen Hurts' demeanor, his attitude, the way he carries himself and what kind of individual and human being he has been. All of that would point to him taking a lesser role with this football team and being part of it moving forward. But the more things happen, hearing Nick Saban audibly say that he was frustrated with the lack of progression from Jalen Hurts during that spring game, and just the fact that it doesn't look as though he's progressing, even though I know that he has spent more time in that facility over the last two months during spring football than his entire career, and you don't see things going in the right direction is concerning to me. And I think the question is no longer, will it be Jalen Hurts or Tua Tunga Bailoa taking the majority of reps? The big question for me is, will Jalen Hurts be on that Alabama roster when they kick off against Louisville? And before I get to that answer, here's a young man who has started four playoff games. Uh, he's played for the national championship. I mean, why? Why would? Why is there? A, why? Why would anything affect him negatively in a spring football game, other than the fact that uh, his progression has been stunted? I don't think it's just the spring football game. I, I think. I think what I took away from the spring football game is not necessarily. Well, he didn't perform well in a scrimmage, so he probably doesn't have a chance to get playing time. What I took away from that is the fact that he's not progressing, I attribute a lack of confidence to that. And the fact that he's not able to go out and release the football at certain points when he's in the pocket, when he's leaving the pocket, when he's going through his reads, that to me shows a guy that potentially has lost his confidence. And if that's the case, how do you really progress? How do you get better? If you don't have the confidence to go out and let the football rip as a quarterback, I don't really see it getting too much better because that's one of the biggest hurdles that you have to overcome to be able to play college football at any position. And if that's something that's stunting his growth, 
I'm not necessarily sure that, that he gets over it looking over his shoulder or looking over the shoulder of a guy like Tua Tunga Vailoa, who I think the family statement made that they're not going anywhere. The fact that his little brother committed and they have moved to Alabama and they're going to be there and they're going to be a part of that football program. So to me, it's just that the lack of confidence is something that seems to be creeping into Jalen Hurts' mind and something I never thought I would say because of his demeanor and the way he had handled himself in some of those big games that you mentioned. You uh, you host a show there, you live there, uh, you hear people every day, and, and I'm really curious, in that state, Cole, uh, is there a prevailing wind, is there a conventional wisdom from the Alabama fans on Jalen Hurts' future? What, what, do they, what do they say and what do they really want to happen? I'm, I'm not talking about the ones who just speak from the hymnal or sing from the hymnal. The rank-and-file Tide fans, what do they want? There is a smaller portion of the fan base that seems to be very appreciative of what he's done and what he means to that program and how he's carried himself and what kind of an individual he is. But I think the diehard football fan in most Alabama fans that we connect with knows what Tua is, has an idea what Tua is capable of, realizes that the ceiling is much higher for Tua Tungavailo, regardless of the fact that they're basing on a, on a very small piece of actual football played. They want what could be better, and they believe that Tua is better. And I don't think that they really care one way or the other if he transfers, if he leaves, if he stays, if he goes. They might tell you that they want him to stay, but they're not going to tell you that they want him to stay and they and they want Tua to be on the bench because they think Tua is the guy that gives them the best opportunity to win football games. So most fans appreciate of Jalen Hurts, but it, when it really comes down to it, they want Tua Tunga by Aloha on the field taking snaps. Before you go, uh, the second story uh, here in a lot of places has had uh, to do with Jeremy Pruitt and what he said, what he meant. Uh, who knows exactly uh, what he was talking about other than that's the last time we have heard from him. Uh, what's your view of uh, the new coach at Tennessee and, 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 and his apparent shot at the fans who didn't come to the spring game? I can't think of a more of a fan base that's more deserving of having a shot directed at them, <laughs> one that just because they did not approve of a potential, not, not a hire, Paul, a potential head coaching hire, that they form a groundswell, an uproar against the administration to potentially go hire someone else, none of which most could name who that replacement should be. And then the time Jeremy Pruitt falls into place, you don't see an outpouring of support at the spring game. I think that was Jeremy Pruitt's way of saying, hey, this is what you guys asked for. This is what you got it. You want you got Phil back in as the AD. You didn't get the guy that you didn't want as head coach. Now I'm taking over. Get in here and support this football team. And I think he wants Tennessee football to mean a lot to a lot of people. He's seen how it's done. He's been at Georgia under Mark Rick. He's been at FSU under Jimbo Fisher. He's been at Alabama under Nick Saban. He understands that recruiting is vital. Fan support is vital to recruiting. It does make a difference. And he wants that program to be great. So I think this is Jeremy Pruitt saying, if we're going to be great, we need to be great in every aspect of our program. Administratively, fan support in the spring game. Obviously, our players not quitting in the spring game and getting as much talent and the best coaching staff here as possible. Cole Kublik, always great to catch up. Thank you, Cole. Be well. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for listening to the Paul Feinbaum Show podcast. The Paul Feinbaum Show airs weekdays on the SEC Network, beginning at 3 Eastern.